All right, so uh, we are going to finish up the mathematical stuff on Thursday, and then after that we'll be doing computer stuff the rest of the time. Uh, and remember that, so uh, we have class today and Thursday, and then next week I'm not going to be here. So I'll give you some computer stuff to work through. Um, and of course you should uh, you know, be working on those practice problems, uh, making sure that you're ready for the written test that's the week after that. Yeah, I'm almost done writing up solutions. So hopefully today I can get you those. Um, I think it is two weeks from Thursday. Um, okay, so before I start, does anyone have any questions about anything we've been talking about? Yeah, when can you guys come to see your call Oh, uh, yeah, uh, my phone isn't connected. Uh, so, so just come over and knock on the door? You can do that or send an email and set up a time. All right. Either one of those is fine. Any other questions? Okay, so um, last time, so remember overall uh, we're getting into equilibrium. I'm going to give you the equations for equilibrium pretty soon. Um, last time I talked about measures of deformation. There were two important measures of deformation. One is the displacement and the other one is the strain. And remember that the tensorial strain so this is like the elements of the strain tensor are defined this way um, exx is equal to one half times the partial of ux with respect to x plus the partial of ux with respect to x. If you look at this for a second, you can see that this one simplifies really easily, but I'm just writing it in the form that makes the sort of pattern evident. So this, in this case, this is just equal to partial of ux with respect to x. And then exy is 1 half times the quantity partial of u x with respect to y plus partial of u y with respect to x. And you just keep going with this, with this pattern. You can name all six of those independent elements. And what's the difference going from the tensorial strain to the engineering strain? Anyone remember that? Um, that is, okay, so um, that is something, but that's not the one that I uh, was talking about last time. So um, when you're using the, uh, so that's the difference between the true strain and the, I think they do call that the engineering strain also, but I'm talking about a different difference. Um, what? Yeah, right. Um, so the distinction I'm talking about is the engineering strain. The only difference are the shear strains. And so um, the engineering XY shear strain is equal to 2 times the tensorial shear strain. Um, and that's true of all the shears. So uh, gamma, I think. Is that right, Jake? Let's call it gamma. Um, 2EXZ and gamma YZ 
is equal to 2EYZ. So um, when you're talking about shear strains, you just always have to have in mind whether you're talking about the elements of the strain tensor or the engineering strains, because they're different values. So the engineering strain is twice the shear strain? Just for the shears. The, the normal strains are the same, but the shear strains are different by a factor of two. OK. Um, so before, um, before I talk about the relationship between stress and strain, um, I want to talk about just sort of uh, intuitive uh, understanding of what these strain values mean. Um, so here are interpretations um, of these different strain values. And I'm going to do it first as I'm going to talk about the normal strain, and then I'm going to talk about the shear strain. So for the normal strain, uh, so let's say that we're starting with this material. This is the undeformed shape. And let's say that undeformed, it has a length this way. So if I'm using a coordinate system with x horizontal and y vertical, I'm going to call this initial length in the x direction, capital L, x, and the initial length in the y direction, capital L, y. And if this goes through a small deformation, so I'm going to draw sort of an exaggerated deformation, but this is supposed to represent a small deformation. Um, let's call the final, uh, the final distance in the x direction lowercase lx, and the final length in the y direction lowercase ly. Then the normal strains are defined like this. EXX is equal to the final X length minus the initial X length divided by the initial X length. And EYY is the final Y length minus the initial Y length divided by the initial Y length. And same thing with ZZ. So that's the quantity uh, lowercase LZ minus uppercase LZ divided by uppercase LZ. Um, and you could actually go through the, um, so if you make the assumption that that entire object has the same strain everywhere, you could show that these formulas match with this partial derivative definition. OK, any questions about that? So those of you who've taken D form, this is the formula that you used at least most of the time for calculating strains. And then the second kind of strain are the shear strains. I am going to define the engineering shear strain. So remember, what I'm giving you here is twice the shear strain that would go in the tensor. Um, so remember that the shear strain uh, deals with changes in angles. 
Um, so in a small um, shear deformation, the angle between positive faces goes from pi over 2 to theta radians. And you have to remember to put these in radians. So for example, um, if this is your initial shape with this coordinate system, after the deformation, and again this is exaggerated just so you can see really clearly what the deformation is, after the deformation, look at the, the positive x face and the positive y face. Those meet right up here at this corner. And after the deformation, this is some angle theta. I'll call this theta x, y. Um, notice that doing it with the two positive faces is important because if you did it with the, like for example, if you did the positive x face and the angle it makes with the negative y face, that would be this angle here. Um, we want this angle that's acute in this case. And then you'd be looking at the obtuse angle. You'd get the totally wrong answer. Okay. But so with this definition of the angles, you can define the engineering shear strain. So gamma xy is equal to 2 exy. And it's equal to pi over 2 minus theta xy. Gamma xz is 2 exz. I keep, I'm calling this exy and exz because it's easier to say, but those are epsilons. Um, this one is equal to pi over 2 minus theta xz. And then gamma yz is equal to 2eyz, and it's equal to pi over 2 minus theta yz. OK, so here's an example problem where we're going to use those um, those interpretations of strain to figure out the strain tensor after a given deformation. So let's say that you have this shape. X is horizontal, Y is vertical. Oh, uh, no, sorry. Let's use a different coordinate system than that. Just use your electronic eraser to erase all those lines you just made. Um, it won't show up after you do that, so don't worry about it. Um, so let's make z vertical, z upwards, and let's make y go to the left. Um, along the y-axis, let's make this initial length 0.15 meters, and along the z-axis, let's make it 0.3 meters. And then after the deformation, this rectangle turns into this parallelogram. Where the new height is 0.31 meters, the new width is 0.14 
meters. And the new angle up here is 88 degrees. And we want to know first what's the strain tensor, and second, what's the Voigt strain. Okay, so uh, first I'm going to calculate the normal strains. And I'm assuming that everything that's out of, out of play and like into the page stays unchanged. So we're not going to have any, um, we're not going to have any XX normal strain. Uh, we're not going to have any XY or XZ shear strains. So E Y Y, we're going to take the final length along the Y direction, so 0.14 minus the initial, 0.15, divided by the initial, and you get a value of negative 0.0667. What are the units of strain? That's right, no dimensions. Um, you have length divided by length, so you just end up with a pure number. Um, and what does the sign tell us? Yeah, um, if it's negative, it's in compression. If it's positive, it's in tension, always. The ZZ strain. We have the final length, 0.31, minus the initial, 0.3, divided by the initial, and you get a value of positive 0.0333. So it's in tension in the z direction, compression in the y direction. And now the shear strain, the only non-zero shear strain we're going to have is the YZ strain. So gamma YZ, which is two times the tensorial strain, is equal to pi over 2 minus whatever 88 degrees is in radians. So do that conversion from 88 degrees and you get 1.536. Do that subtraction and you get positive 0 0.0349. What does the sign tell you on the shear strains? Well, if you, um, so yeah, the, um, you're thinking of it right. The, so a positive shear strain means that those two positive faces become acute, an acute angle, and a negative shear strain means those two positive faces become obtuse. So in this case, um, like notice, the angle that I chose was in a different spot than I did in that example a minute ago. That's because the way I drew the coordinate system here, the positive Y face is this, positive Z face is this, so the angle that matters is right there. And so it's this angle that becomes 88 degrees. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, that's right. Uh, yes, so if you look at the, um, so this formula only works for, um, 
for small deformations because it's making that small angle approximation where uh, the tangent of an angle is approximately equal to the angle itself as long as that angle difference is small, you know. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a tangent relationship too. You could figure all that out from the, um, the differential, you know, the derivative form of uh, the shear strain too. Okay, so uh, the tensor now, putting these all together, we have nothing for xx. For yy, we have negative 0 0.0667. For zz, we have positive 0 0.0333. We have nothing for xz. Uh, sorry, for xy. We have nothing for xz. And then for yz, we have 0 0.0349. Oh no, sorry. I didn't, I didn't take the last step that I needed to make. So, remember that this is the engineering strain, right? And so if you're going to put it in the tensor, you need to divide that by two to get the tensorial strain. So take half of that, and the YZ strain should be 0 0.0175 here. And then for the Voigt strain, so this is the tensor. For the Voigt strain, um, we have the normals, so EXX, EYY, EZZ, and then we have the engineering strains in the order YZ, XZ, XY. Uh, YZ the engineering strain is positive 0 0.0349. And then the other two are both zeros. So that's the Voigt strain. And the key thing to remember here is that these are not the same as this. OK? So when you're talking about the void strain, you need the engineering strain. When you're talking about the tensor, you need the other one. Any questions about that? Yes, I guess what depends on the angle being small is this definition. Um, so, Yes, that's right. The, the partial derivative definition is, is like a definition. That's always accurate. This is an approximation, um, but there are a lot of things. Basically, everything we're going to do in this class is related to, it requires small deformations um, because we're going to be using a linear relationship between stress and strain, which only holds when you have small deformations. Um, and so for everything we're going to do in this class, this is a good way to think about it. Ever, I mean, I want to point you maybe some about, about, I want, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, OK, so um, like if, you are, um, if you're using finite elements to measure what's going to happen to the hood of a car, in a car accident or something, that's going to be big deformations. 
Okay, and so you wouldn't use you wouldn't use this relationship. You also wouldn't anymore be able to use the relationship. That, well, there's two more things. Um, you wouldn't be able to use the relationship that says there between stress and strain, you multiply by a constant matrix. Because it wouldn't be linear anymore. You'd be into a nonlinear thing. And I, I guess in the example that I chose, it would also be plastic deformation. You'd have to do an addition to elastic. So um, yeah, so if you're doing a problem where there are going to be big deformations, and obviously you're right, like there's a lot of applications where you want to know stuff about big deformations. Um, there's a lot of complexity that comes into a lot of different spots. You know what I mean? Um, it gets everything gets a lot more complicated when it's not linear. In this class, though, we're, it's always going to be linear. Yeah, as long as it's elastic, that that holds. Even if it's nonlinear, that partial derivative thing holds. Okay. Any other questions? All right. So um, now we've talked about the different ways you can think about deformation, uh, two different kind of definitions of strain. So let's talk about the relationship between stress and strain. Um, The relationship between stress and strain is called the constitutive relationship. That's the relationship between stress and strain. And we're going to do this in terms of the Voigt stress and the Voigt strain. So um, if you write out the Voigt stress, xx, yy, zz, yz, xz, um, and x, y, and I have these all written, well, these are the stresses. OK, so there is the Voigt stress. And we're going to relate that to the Voigt strain by multiplying it by a matrix. Um, so the Voigt strain over here is E, x, x. EYY, EZZ, then 2EYZ, 2EXZ, and 2EXY. Um, so to go from uh, 1 by 6, Uh, six by one, I guess, matrix to another six by one, we're going to have to multi multiply by a six by six matrix. Okay, so this is a six by six matrix of material constants. Um, that's generally not good. Um, if you're trying to figure out how to model like steel or something, this is saying that we need to do 36 tests on a piece of steel to figure out what these 36 values are to relate the stress and the strain. Um, that sounds, it sounds very unlikely that we're going to be able to come up with tests to independently figure out 36 properties of the material. Um, but the good news is uh, 
if the material behaves the same in every direction, anyone remember what that's called? Yep, good. So if it's an isotropic material, um, we can write these 36 values in terms of only two constants. Those are the Young's modulus, capital E, and the Poisson's ratio, the Greek letter nu. So it's a lot more likely that we're going to be able to come up with two tests to come up with these two constants than having to figure out 36. So that's really good news. And it turns out that these two values are very easy to test for. Um, e is just a measure of how much stretch you get for a certain amount of axial force, a certain amount of axial, um, what did I say? It's the amount of deformation you get for a certain amount of axial load. And Poisson's ratio, just as a measure of if you, say, compress a material down, how much do the sides bulge out? Those are both really easy measurements to take. Um, and so in terms of these, uh, well, OK, so let's talk about that assumption of isotropy for a second. Um, not every material is isotropic. Um, if you're trying to come up with a material that's not isotropic, look for one that, you know, where the atoms are aligned in a, what's that? 3D printed. Yeah, right. So the, the 3D printed material is not too far off from isotropic. So um, I'm sort of curious, actually, like I'd like to see what kind of measurements you could get by assuming it was isotropic. Um, I think it was about 10% off, if I remember. Like, the strength in one direction was about 10% higher than the strength in the other d dimension. Um, but yeah, so technically, that 3D printed plastic, you wouldn't be able to make this assumption. You could probably get some reasonable, you know, some okay results by assuming that it was isotropic, but it technically isn't. Um, anything where, like, any kind of atomic structure is aligned, like, um, if you have uh, like carbon fiber where all the um, where all of the uh, atoms are aligned in a certain way, you could expect that to have a different strength in one direction than another. Wood or bone um, are not isotropic. Um, you know, like a, a thigh bone is really good at resisting compression along its long axis, not as good at resisting compression on the sides. So, but engineering materials often are isotropic. Um, metals, um, unless you've made a huge effort to make all of the, um, to make all of the lattices align the same way, uh, metal is isotropic. And so we're gonna assume isotropy for the rest of this class. And all of the examples and stuff we're gonna do are gonna be have to do with plastic and metal. Um, OK, so this matrix here, the relationship. So what's the matrix that you multiply to the strain to get the stress? This is called the stiffness matrix.
Um, so if you think of like metal or some you know hard engineering material, um, the strains that we're going to be dealing with are really small numbers. It's not going to deform very much, and the stresses are going to be really big. Okay, and so if you need a matrix that you're going to multiply to something tiny to get something big, are these numbers going to be big or little? These are going to be big. So the stiffness matrix is going to have big values. You could also take the inverse of this matrix and come up with a matrix that you could multiply to the stress to get the strain. In that case, you'd be going from something you know, big to something small, so all those values would have to be tiny. And that's called the compliance matrix. Okay, so the compliance matrix, I'm going to give that first because it's easier to remember these. Um, the compliance matrix is 1 over E, negative nu over E, negative nu over E, and then 0, 0, 0. Then you have negative nu over e, 1 over e, negative nu over e, 0, 0, 0. Then you have negative nu over e, negative nu over e, 1 over e, 0, 0, 0. And then you have 0, 0, 0. 2 times the quantity 1 plus nu over e, 0, 0. And then the next row just has uh, this, the non-zero element from before moved over to the fifth column. So four zeros and then 2 times the quantity 1 plus nu over e, 0. And then the last one has it moved into the last column. So 2 times the quantity 1 plus nu over e. And um, this is what you would use if you want um, if you want to calculate the Voigt strain as a function of the Voigt stress. And then um, if you wanted to come up, so if you remembered this one, you could always plug these symbolically into your calculator take the inverse, and it'll give you the form of the stiffness matrix. But um, I'll give that to you once. Um, so the stiffness matrix Am I going too fast? Can you go back a slide? Yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, the stiffness matrix S. Um, so there's a uh, factor that's pulled out in front. That's E over the quantity 1 plus nu, quantity 1 minus 2 nu. And then the elements inside the matrix are the quantity 1 minus nu, then nu, nu, 0, 0, 0. And then for the second row, nu, quantity 1 minus nu, nu, 0, 0, 0. And then the third row, nu, nu, 1 minus nu, 
0, 0, 0. And then all zeros except the fourth column. And the fourth column is quantity 1 minus 2 nu divided by 2. Then for the next row, move that, uh, that expression to the fifth column. Everything else is 0. So 1 minus 2 nu over 2. And then move it to the last column. So quantity 1 minus 2 nu over 2. And this is the matrix that you use if you want to um, calculate the Voigt stress as a function of the Voigt strain. Whoops. Yeah, that's something that you know for a material. Like for steel, um, that's the one we're going to use the most. Um, Young's modulus for steel, you can just Google it. Um, it changes a little bit depending on how much carbon you have. Uh, but, yep, 200 times 10 to the ninth pascals or 200 gigapascals. And um, Poisson's ratio is right around 0.3. If I remember, it's a little over 0.3, usually like maybe 0.33. And that's non dimensional. And so inverting that will give us the Poisson's ratio? Yep, that's right. All right, uh, so now that's pretty much all we need to know about the relationship between stress and strain. This says that however you get these values, if you get all the strain values or if you get all the stress values, you can use this matrix to figure out the other one. So knowing one is equivalent to knowing the other if you have linear elasticity, okay? Um, so now I'm going to give you the requirements for equilibrium. Requirements for equilibrium, that's like the stress and strain version of Newton's second law. Um, it's the requirement, you know, it's what you use to solve a problem and figure out what the stress is. Um, first, I'm going to give it in terms of stresses. The derivation of this actually isn't that, isn't that complicated, and we could work through it. Um, I, it wouldn't be, you know, terribly painful, uh, but it would take a while, so we're just going to skip it. I'm going to give you these equations. Um, So partial of the xx stress with respect to x plus the partial of the xy stress with respect to y plus the partial of the xz stress with respect to z plus bx, I'll tell you what that is in a second, is equal to zero. The second equation is partial of the uh, xy stress with respect to x plus the partial of the yy stress with respect to y plus the partial of the yz stress 
with respect to z plus b y is equal to 0. And then third, the partial of the x z stress with respect to x plus the partial of the yz stress with respect to y plus the partial of the zz stress with respect to z plus bz is equal to 0. Where these values bx, by and bz um, are a force per volume acting at each point in the material. usually gravity, although, you know, this could be any kind of field doing this. Like, if it was relevant to your problem, this could be an electric field or a magnetic field. Um, all right, so these equations, it's a system of three differential equations. Are they PDEs or ODEs? Well, it has partial derivatives in it, so they're PDEs, partial differential equations. Um, and so the next uh, thing you need to do is what are the, like to make sense out of any differential equations, uh, what are the independent variables and what are the dependent variables? Remember, the dependent ones are the functions you're trying to find. The independent ones are, are the ones that everything's written in terms of. So what are the independent variables? Yeah, that's right. So um, x, y, and z are the independent variables. And the dependent variables are those stress elements. Okay, so this is saying we have three partial differential equations to solve for six functions of x, y, and z. Okay, that's not enough information. Just like with linear equations, you can't find more functions than you have equations. So this is not. Um, You need more to solve for these. And what you need are called compatibility equations. I'm not going to go into that. But the reason you need it is because you have three equations for six functions. Um, I'm going to give you another form for these uh, that instead of having the stress elements as the, as the dependent variables, has the displacements. So those displacements then, displacement is a vector, so there's only going to be three of them, and we're going to have three partial differential equations for three dependent variables, and that, that you don't need any extra equations for. So. You can reformulate this in terms of displacement vectors.
And then it's self-contained. You don't have to worry about those extra equations. So what's a, can anyone think of like a blueprint for, so we have, this is the starting point. How are we going to express these in terms of displacements? Well, we know we have a way to calculate the strain in terms of the stress, right? So we could use this, uh, use the um, compliance matrix to write these equations in terms of the strains, right? And then we have that definition relationship between displacement and strain, like EXX is equal to one half times the partial of UX with respect to X, blah, blah, blah. Remember, those are all a few pages back. Um, then use that to make that last step down to displacement. So it's horribly awful as a bookkeeping thing, but it's like conceptually, it's not hard. It's just uh, really a pain to go through. But here's what you get if you do it. And I, um, I separated some stuff into constants uh, so that you could sort of see the form of it without, without a ton of constants floating around. Um, but it looks like this. K1 times the second partial of UX with respect to X. plus another constant, K3, times the second partial of UX with respect to Y, plus K3 times the second partial of UX with respect to Z, plus, let me just call this K4, so K4 times the second partial of UY dy dx plus K4 times the second partial of UZ dz dx plus that body force representing the gravity usually is equal to zero. So that's the first of the three. Then the second equation says K3 times the second partial of UY with respect to X plus K1 times the second partial of UY with respect to Y plus K3 times the second partial of u, y with respect to z plus k4 times the second partial of u, x, dy, dx plus k4 times the second partial of u z d z d y plus b y is equal to zero. And the last one, if you look through these, you can see sort of a pattern that these are all following. Um, it's probably not worth thinking about too much, but um, 
The last one says K3 times the second partial of UZ with respect to X plus K3 times the second partial of UZ with respect to Y plus K1 times the second partial of UZ with respect to Z plus K4 times the second partial of UX dz dx plus k4 times the second partial of uy dz dy plus bz is equal to zero. So this is three PDEs. for three functions. Those functions are ux is a function of x, y, and z. uy is a function of x, y, and z. And uz is a function of x, y, and z. And if you could come up with a general solution for this system of PDEs. Um, and not only, I, you know, these are also linear PDEs. That's a good sign. Uh, if you could come up with a general solution for this, there'd be no need for finite elements or anything. We could come up with closed form solutions for whatever. Um, when you combine this with the boundary conditions, and those boundary conditions come up come from whatever loads or displacements you have at the edges. But you can't. I mean, it's, it's too complicated. Um, so you could use numerical PDE solvers to do this. And in some cases, that makes sense. Um, but that ends up being pretty hard, too, when you have complicated geometry. Uh, if you've looked through um, the practice problems at all yet, um, there are, I think, two problems on there where you have to verify that a certain solution meets the equilibrium conditions. That doesn't mean you have to solve these equations. That's working the easy way. Um, you, have a, you have a function like this, and then all you have to do is go through the steps of taking those derivatives and making sure that they match. Okay, so. It's a lot easier to verify something than to come up with the solution from these equations. You know what I mean? Um, all right. Any questions about that? All right. So next time I'm going to give you the other way of looking at equilibrium. Uh, that's an energy approach. That's the way that you use in finite elements. And uh, we'll go through some example problems and then we'll be done with this.